theme that runs all the way through Scripture and finally finds its fulfillment in the ultimate substitutional death, which was that of Christ on the cross. He who knew no sin was made to be sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. And so that is the brazen altar. When you move through, there is a laver. And uh, the laver was a place where you wash. It was ceremonial washing of hands and feet. And uh, a priest would have to stop here at the laver before he went into the tabernacle proper, this building here, which was 15 feet by 45 feet. And he had to stop at the laver and ceremonially, ceremonially cleanse before he could go in, symbolic of the fact that uh, the, for the believer to have fellowship with God, to enter into fellowship with God, you need daily cleansing. The 24th Psalm says, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in my holy place? And the answer comes back, He who has clean hands and a pure heart. The cleansing always precedes communion with God. And that concept is written right into the very ceremonies that they are doing. This is the tabernacle proper. This is the courtyard and the tabernacle proper. The tabernacle proper has two rooms. The first one is called the holy place and the second one is called the holy of holies. In the holy place, there are three pieces of furniture. What are they? If you were to walk in, on your left would be what? A golden lampstand. On your right would be a table of showbread. And straight in front of you would be the altar of incense. Everything in this room is covered or made of gold. The lampstand is hammered out of gold. The table and the altar are made of wood overlaid with gold. Now that's a change of material because the laver outside and the altar were covered with a bronze or a, a copper material called mostly translated bronze. And bronze in the Bible stands for judgment of sin. And uh, we come in here though we have the golden uh, quality that is uh, revealed here. And then there's a curtain, a veil, that separates the holy place and the holy of holies, and only once a year could the high priest enter that, and when he did, it was with the blood, first of a, of a bull, and then the blood of a goat. And he would enter there first to make atonement for himself and his family, and the second time he entered that day was to make atonement for all the sins of Israel on the Day of Atonement. And uh, so that's what was happening there. All right, there's just a little bit of the structure of it, the holy place and the holy of holies. And you would see the, the golden altar. There were four coverings. Uh, this was fine twisted linen embroidered with some very colorful things. Uh, and then on uh, covering that was um, goat skin, wasn't it? And then covering that was ram skin dyed red. And covering that was sea cows, the hide of sea cows. You say, what's a sea cow? Well, they're extinct today. But that's what they look like, or looked like. And they're not a very good picture. But they were pretty good size, and they went from two to four tons. Pretty good size animal, and they were real slow moving, which made them easy to hunt and catch. And uh, after the Europeans discovered these back in 1700s, 14 years later, they were extinct. They had hunted them all, and they were dead. In fact, when they were discovered, the estimates are there were really only about 1,500 of them left because Aborigines had hunted them. But you don't need to know that, so I won't even mention it. The brazen altar, the labor. Okay, the events at Sinai. The last one, the books that were written there were the book of 
Exodus and Leviticus. The books of Exodus and Leviticus at Sinai. Exodus and Leviticus. What happened to Kadesh Barnea? They sent spies. They returned. And we've kind of been through that, haven't we? No? Okay, they sent spies into the land. Chapter 13 of Numbers. Two had a good report. Ten had a bad report. I'll get out of the way. The promised land was denied to that first generation in chapter 14, verse 29. And the verses following. It was denied to them. Uh, God postponed. Um, the promised land was denied to that generation in 1429. And God postponed it in the same verse to the next generation. If you were 20 years of age and older, you didn't go in. You died in the wilderness. And so that's the postponement of those things at that point. There's another thing that happened at Kadesh Barnea, and we've already mentioned it. What was another thing? I don't have it on the screen yet. What was another thing that happened? Moses struck the rock a second time. This time in anger and in disobedience to God. And what did that cost him? He said, you'll never enter the promised land. We'll let you see it. And he, so he took him to the top of a mountain, let him look over and see it. But he would never enter it. Have you ever wondered why? I mean, a lot of Israelites disobeyed God. I, I doubt that Joshua and Caleb were perfect. They were the two spies that voted, yeah, let's go in. But have you ever wondered why? In the New Testament, we find out that the rock was Christ. It's symbolic of Christ, from which flow the living waters that give life. And Christ could be sacrificed how many times? Once. Struck only once. And from that time on, you ne merely need to speak to the rock, the Lord Jesus. And speaking, he provides for us our needs. All right, then you have, let's move on, there's Moses strikes the rock the second time, chapter 20. There he is. You got a picture of him. Maybe not. Events in the wilderness wandering. Um, Israel goes to Moab and they make their way finally to Mount Hor in the area, the territory of Moab. Moab was a son, the original Moabite, Moab was a son of who? Whom? Lot. What was his other son's name? Ammon. All right, but he doesn't figure into the story. Okay, and uh, at Mount Hor, um, you have the death of Aaron in chapter 20. And then in chapter 22, the Moabites really, uh, they were, the Moabites were opposing Israel to pass through their territory. said, no, you can't pass through it. We, we need to pass through this territory on our way to the promised land. No, you can't pass through our territory. Look, we, we won't let our flocks drink from your wells or anything. No, you can't pass through our territory. And uh, make a long story short, Balaam and, and, and Barak enter into an agreement uh, to try to curse the nation of Israel. Now the reason that this is so noteworthy is it goes on from chapter 22 through 24 trying to curse Israel and every time the prophet opened his mouth only blessing could come out and he only blessed Israel which was rather maddening and so in chapter 24 there is a wonderful uh, prophecy that I think the wise men used. Does anybody know what it is? In chapter 24 of Numbers. Uh, 
Well, Balak is, Bala, uh, Balak is really angry against Balaam. And, and he says, you know, he says in verse 10 of chapter 24, I summons you to curse my enemies, but you have blessed them these three times. Now, now leave it once and go home. I said I would reward you handsomely, but the Lord has kept you from being rewarded. It's twisted sort of logic, isn't it? And uh, finally, though, look at verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the sons of Sheth. Interesting, isn't it? So instead of it being a curse to Israel, it, he winds up cursing the very people he's supposed to be benefiting. And that's, uh, that is right there. And that takes place right at Mount Hor, right there south of the Dead Sea area. Okay, events in the wilderness wandering. There are a few things we want to note. The people of the second generation are numbered. Moses... Uh, he says, okay, the first generation are dead. Now we need to number Israel by tribes. And we're going to get a count so that we know when we're allotting the land uh, how that all figures out. And so they, they uh, number the people in chapter 26 uh, and uh, then of numbers. And then uh, Joshua is appointed the new leader for it's known that Moses is going to die and not enter the land. And so that's in chapter 27, verse 12. And then the law is repeated to the second generation in Numbers 28 to 30, and then the whole book, of, not the whole book, but a good deal of the book of Deuteronomy. And then, then there are two and a half tribes that decide that they want to settle on the Transjordan side. Now, what's the Transjordan side? East of the Jordan River. And some of the tribes say, you know, this is good land. We, we think this is wonderful. We want to settle on this side, Moses. And so permission is granted for them to do so. And uh, that information is given in Numbers chapter 32 for them to... Uh